Man should return to his source, and this source is in his divine origin, whether we like it or not. We got used to subscribing to Darwin's theory, but the thing is, it's only a theory. That's why it's called Darwin's theory of evolution, while the divine origin of the world is a reality. Today, more and more physicists and other scientists are talking about the creation of the universe and everything in it. And this does mean creation, as opposed to some sort of random emerging into being out of nowhere. Ever since man arrived in this divine world, he has used it and consumed it for his pleasures and whims at the cost of polluting and destroying everything around him. The trouble is that mankind remains blind to the fact that all illnesses, pandemics and human suffering is nothing but divine retribution for what we're doing. Whenever God sends a disease into our world, he always supplies a remedy. We only need to discover it. Robert Freitas, an American scientist and founder of the nanomedicine theory, defines nanomedicine as a science as well as a technique that can be used to detect, treat and prevent various illnesses and traumas by application of molecular technical agents and instruments based on scientific knowledge of the human body's molecular structure. Surgeons have advanced from stitching and amputating to repairing hearts and reattaching limbs. Using fine tools, they join delicate blood vessels and nerves. Yet even the best microsurgeon can't cut and stitch finer tissue structures. Modern scalpels and sutures are too coarse for repairing capillaries, cells and molecules. Consider delicate surgery from a cell's perspective. A huge blade sweeps down, chopping past and through the molecular machinery of a crowd of cells, slaughtering thousands. Later, a great obelisk plunges through the crowd, dragging a cable as wide as a freight train behind it to rope the crowd together again. Only the ability of cells to abandon their dead, regroup and multiply makes healing possible. Drug therapy, unlike surgery, deals with the finest structures in cells. And drug molecules are simple molecular devices. Many affect specific molecules in cells. But drug molecules work without direction. Once dumped into the body, they tumble and bump around haphazardly until they bump a target molecule, fit and stick, affecting its function. Though drug molecules affect the tissues on a molecular level, they are too primitive to feel, plan and function independently. And so Eric Drexler arrives at the conclusion that nanosystems created by man for medical purposes must have an unsurpassable advantage over any other medical technology. However, his passion for this rationale makes his argument somewhat one-sided. Drexler's convinced that the drugs of the future should be able to feel, strategize and function as intelligent agents. His forecast is that such drugs and technologies will enter the market in about 30 to 40 years. Imagine his surprise when he finds out that such drugs have been around for quite a while. They were developed in the USSR 30 years ago. Since the mid-20th century, science has been developing knowledge in structural biology, biochemistry, electronics, and studies of structure and composition of materials. At first, breakthroughs were made in one-time lab experiments, but in time, the results became commonly achievable, and thus, we finally learned to study matter at a nano level. Nano is derived from the Greek word nanos, meaning dwarf, and denotes one billionth part of a whole. The term nanotechnology refers to technologies operating with objects the size of one billionth of a meter, the so-called nanometer, which approximately equals the measure across six carbon atoms. Similarly, terms nanomachine, nanorobot, and nanocomputer refer to complex technical objects produced as a result of operations with substances at the molecular level. We are in the laboratory 
We are now in the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Laboratory of the Moscow Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry. The device you see is a superpower microscope that allows us to see objects the size of an atom. It's as powerful as the Hubble telescope, and it's designed to look at the infinitely small. It gives us a glimpse of the universe the way it was billions of years ago, so that we can admire its infinite beauty. With its help, we can get an atom-precise view of everything within our own bodies. First of all, I'd like to say that what's going on with nanoprojects now reminds me of the nuclear and space projects that the Soviet Union ran in the 1940s and 50s. Oh, one difference, however, is that back in those times, there were landmark events, such as the launch of the first Sputnik, or man's first flight into space, or the first nuclear bomb explosion. And as soon as they were announced, the whole planet immediately knew that a breakthrough had been made. But I don't think anything like that is possible with a nanoproject. The scope of nanotechnology is so vast that there cannot be any single major breakthrough. And the range of its application will also be unprecedented. You have a grandstand seat here to one of the most momentous events in the history of science. In the mid-20th century, mankind did not merely accomplish a major breakthrough. He trampled on the most essential of all bands, thou shalt not kill, this time on a global scale, and found himself facing a new reality. That new reality included a direct road to the potential and complete extermination of man as a species. Man went far beyond self-preservation instincts. Lured by the temptation to seize the ultimate military advantage, he developed thermonuclear weapons, something never seen before. In the 1960s, the people of the USSR, the same people who defeated Hitler and saved the world from the Nazis at the cost of millions of its citizens' lives, faced again a stark choice – to be or not to be. At the time, the USA was actively developing its nuclear program. U.S. naval and military bases and those of its allies were deployed in dangerous proximity to the USSR's borders. It gave the USA a major strategic advantage, the capacity for multiple strikes, which could kill millions of people in major Russian cities, terrify those who survived, and strip the country of communications, power supplies, medical help and centralized control. The American army was the only one in the world to have tested nuclear weapons in action, and the US seemed to be quite comfortable with this fact. The only way to hold back the Americans was to develop a capacity for a counterattack which would be just as powerful. Only the prospect of a fatal blow hitting American soil was an argument convincing enough for presidents and generals. However, our country's geographical location wasn't helping this plan. The U.S. territory, including its strategic targets, was practically out of the Soviet Army's reach. That's why the USSR made it a top priority to develop a strategic nuclear submarine force, which was subsequently deployed in the vicinity of the U.S. coastline. Successful underwater missile launch tests let the world know that there would be no easy military solution against the USSR. It would have been impossible to destroy all Soviet submarines, while a single counterattack from the depths of the ocean would have been enough to visit serious destruction on US soil, should it choose to launch the first strike. Ever since then, Russian nuclear submarines have been on permanent duty protecting our country. 
These changes, however, brought about new challenges to the military medical service. The high level of responsibility combined with the unparalleled difficulty of military duty on nuclear submarines resulted in such serious impairment to submariners' health that it began to jeopardize the efficiency of the entire strategic shield of our country. Submarine crews had to stay on duty for many months. They had to deal with frequent malfunctions of the nuclear power units. These submarines were new and had not been fully tested at the time. All this was causing severe health problems with the submariners. The Russian Navy's medical service had to address a new condition which was termed premature aging effect. This effect had also been noted in other military branches, such as supersonic jet pilots in the Air Force or silo staff in the Missile Defense Force. All of these cases shared the same symptoms, severe impairment of the following systems, which are critical to life. Immune system, endocrine system, nervous system, cardiovascular system, reproductive system, vision. The Army Command Headquarters ordered the medical force to find a solution that would lead to the complete recovery of the affected personnel. In other words, they had to find a way to reverse premature aging. Clinical studies revealed that the key to the whole process was a disturbance in metabolism. Cell of various tissues would lose their vitality. First they would become dormant, second they would stop reproducing and then finally die. Metabolism. Metabolism. Metabolism is a set of ongoing chemical reactions that happen in living organisms to maintain their life. Metabolism uses energy to construct components of cells such as proteins and nucleic acids. Metabolism is the fundamental mechanism sustaining vital functions in humans and all other living organisms. The organs in young men's bodies would grow old and weak, and the usual treatment approach that prescribed resting, a special diet and conventional therapies was not helping. It looked as if a malevolent sci-fi time machine clock was working inside the soldiers' bodies, killing off tissue cells at a much faster rate than usual. This discovery gave the researchers insight into the nature of the problem. The tasks were shared, but only the army medical staff were aware of the ultimate goal of the research. It was a highly classified project. That year, Vyacheslav Morozov and myself were in our final year of studies at the Leningrad Military Medical Academy. By that time, we had already been researching the problems of recovery of vital bodily functions impaired by radiation, traumas and intoxication for three years. And in all these cases, the adverse impact basically came down to suppressed protein synthesis. So the question was how could we recover the synthesis? We decided to use a physiological approach. We studied the organs and processes, which are impaired first and most severely, such as the immune system, brain, liver, heart, and the reproductive system in young calves and pigs. We were able to identify and produce agents, which helped improve the impaired functions of these organs, when introduced via an injection. The important thing here was that the agent obtained from the immune system turned out to help restore the immune system function. The agent recovered from the brain improved the brain function and the heart agents facilitated the heart recovery. In other words, we discovered tissue-specific regulation processes that yielded a reliable and positive effect. Students talk about Morozov and Kavinson walking the corridors of the Oncology Institute, asking for someone who would be willing to research the pineal gland. I was an educated chap, and I knew that it was a very significant gland, and so I volunteered. The St. Petersburg Oncology Institute's research laboratory was the oldest experimental lab in the USSR. It was engaged in an anti-cancer research program. Here, in the Institute's animal test facility, we started researching tissues extracted from immune and endocrine systems glands. The thymus is a gland of the immune system. Just like bone marrow, it plays an essential role in the function of the immune system that protects the body on all levels. The thymus is located behind the breastbone. It is the first organ of the immune system that develops in a fetus. 
pineal body is a small endocrine gland located near the center of the brain between the two hemispheres. It produces the serotonin derivative melatonin. Melatonin regulates the function of the endocrine system, modulation of wake sleep patterns, seasonal behavior in many animals, blood pressure, function of brain cells, and function of the gastrointestinal tract. The pineal gland's key function is to regulate daily biorhythms, so one could say that it is responsible for the body's inner biological clock. This clock's malfunction results in a rapid deterioration of health. We incited premature aging in test animals and proceeded to administer the obtained agents to one group of subjects and monitor them against the control group. Upon completion of the treatment course, we compared cell samples obtained from the two groups. This research method allowed us to run a thorough and comprehensive study of any agent. We produced a preparation out of the substances extracted from the thymus. Its patent name is thymoline. It's been on our country's pharmaceutical market for over 20 years now. It's available over the counter at any drugstore. It was the world's first developed immune system preparation. Later on, further research of this drug revealed that its active agents are peptides. Peptides and proteins. A human body consists of 100 trillion cells and each of these cells is comprised of hundreds of millions of protein molecules. Proteins can be said to be the construction material of our bodies. They also function as true nanomachines. Each of the hundreds of thousands of various proteins is distinguished by a unique structure and every single protein has a specific task it performs within the body. We can distinguish between proteins of bones and muscular tissues and those of skin and our brains. Specific proteins called enzymes and hormones control functioning of all body systems. Large protein molecules consist of peptides. We made two principal discoveries. The first one was that peptides extracted from the pineal gland inhibit tumor development. We ran a comparison test against melatonin, which was known to be able to inhibit breast cancer development in mice by 54%. Our preparation, which we called epitalon, yielded a result of 80 to 90 percent. In addition, we ran another test on menopausal rats to see if the agent could recover their reproductive function. The results were shocking. The aging rats went back to a normal menstrual cycle, and when we put young male rats into their cage, they produced a healthy litter. This report was published by the Academy of Sciences and we received an award in recognition of this discovery. Back then, these young researchers had no idea that the conclusions they arrived at would lay the groundwork for a whole new branch of scientific research. In 1971, after we had produced those preparations, my friend and I were transferred to serve in the Transbaikal Military District. We graduated from the Military Medical Academy with the rank of lieutenants and were eligible for military duty. We received an award from the Military Medical Academy. We had thought that admission to a postgraduate program would surely be ours, but we were ordered to serve in the army first. The scope of the military duty assigned to the young lieutenants included further scientific research. However, the problem was that this was barely understood by their direct superiors. At some point, rumors reached my ears. People were saying, look, they're good fellows, but they're so much into science and research. While we're doing completely different things here, we're on military duty, please take them back. And so I called them back to Leningrad, to my research lab. However, we never made it back to the academy. We got stuck in a medical battalion in the Leningrad region. That was it. We had to figure out what to do in this situation. We looked round and found a way to continue our research at the Petrov Oncology Institute. That's where we completed our PhD while serving in the medical battalion. In this manner, our researchers on military duty continued their obstacle course, overcoming one trouble after another for almost 10 years, until Deputy Defense Minister General Perhotkin signed an order that put an end to their hardships, and they finally got the opportunity to establish their own research unit, which was soon equipped with a proper testing facility. It was the first lab in the Military Medical Academy that was established by the order of the USSR State Committee on Science and Research. It was 1983 and military involvement with Afghanistan was ongoing, as was the nuclear standoff in deep sea waters. 
And this was a weapon too. We developed six new preparations in the shortest possible time. Today, all of them are available on the market, and they are widely used in medical practice. More than 15 million people have benefited from our developments over the last 20 years. In many cases, the drugs proved to be very effective. But what's more, there was not a single case of negative side effects or any allergies. These are safe medications because they employ the mechanisms of nature itself. By the mid-80s, Morozov and Kavinson had been able to learn more about the role peptides played in molecular synthesis. They also developed a research network and established cooperation with some of the country's best research centers that helped in developing the synthetic analogues of peptides of animal origin. We started breaking up this compound in our lab at the Bioorganic Chemistry Institute. We defined its active agents and then we just got stuck. We couldn't move on, as we didn't know what was in it. They just gave us a tiny amount of the substance and asked us to solve its structure. The staff of the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Laboratory succeeded in identifying the spatial and chemical structure of the thymic peptide molecule. It was an easy and routine task for us. We took a sample, examined it, identified the formula and reported the result. This allowed us to manufacture the preparation by means of chemical synthesis as opposed to extracting it from animals. It was a major breakthrough when researchers succeeded in producing short peptides with predefined properties which were close to the organic ones. Thanks to this, mass production of new preparations, called peptide bioregulators, was launched in the Soviet Union. The laboratory was distinguished with government awards, the authors received further promotion and scientific degrees, as well as the green light for further research. All the developed preparations were protected with domestic and international patents. By and large, just two types of molecules maintain our life. Proteins or peptides that carry the information and the DNA that carries its specific information too. The DNA is, however, just a matrix. It is a molecule that by itself performs no function. Only when a relevant peptide connects with the corresponding segment of the DNA will it trigger off the synthesis of specific proteins. And that's the key to life. Basically, it comes down to the very question of how life came into being on our planet. And from what we saw, it was this way. In other words, we managed to replicate nature itself. In April 1986, nuclear disaster hit Chernobyl, Ukraine. 200,000 people were evacuated from the contaminated area. Over 600,000 people took part in the work to contain the contamination. Many of these people were exposed to high radiation levels. Both military and civil medical services were struggling to help the victims. Peptide preparations were administered in high doses and helped dramatically reduce the mortality rate. This actually got lower than the average mortality rate across the country at the time. The experts explain this by the fact that providing the best quality health care to those involved was the top priority at the time. It was much better and efficient medical care than the rest of the country was receiving on a routine basis. In April 1989, another nuclear disaster occurred in the Norwegian Sea. A fire broke out on board the nuclear submarine Komsomolets, which subsequently sank. The disaster took the lives of 42 crew members out of 69 due to fire and prolonged exposure to low temperatures in ice-cold water. Even today, no one can really explain how crew members managed to survive a full 90 minutes in the ice-cold water. 15 minutes is the established survival limit for the Barents Sea. The 27 surviving submariners were treated in the Northern Fleet Naval Medical Center. The treatment was a success. The submariners fully recovered and were able to return to military duty. 
борьбе за их жизнь также The treatment program also included peptide preparations invented by Vyacheslav Marazov and Vladimir Kavinson. Along with the other medical staff, they received a new promotion as a reward for this achievement. Marozov and Kavinson were promoted to colonels of the USSR medical force. The laboratory also received an achievement award. In 1991, the operation of the laboratory of peptide bioregulators was discontinued. The state lifted its protection from the laboratory's patents. The army contracts were discontinued. The employees lost their jobs. The researchers who achieved a major breakthrough found themselves in the streets. Military medicine began to break up. Vladimir Kavinson was under pressure. It was the end, basically. The lab was dismantled. They were left on their own to find an answer to the question, who would now be interested in their past achievements? The answer was given by life itself. In Russia, from 1992 to 2004, 11 million premature deaths in men and 4 million premature deaths in women were registered in the 15 to 69 age group. These were people who had failed to adjust to the shockingly new order of life they suddenly faced. The entire population was exposed to continuous high stress. People were scared for the lives of their loved ones. Premature aging syndrome was no longer the curse of submarine crews. It now hit Russia's entire population. The new task that Vyacheslav Marozov and Vladimir Kavinson, no longer holders of military ranks, set for themselves, was to find a way to extend the lifespan of people experiencing aging, whether premature or timely. By 1992 they had succeeded in establishing the Institute for Bioregulation and Gerontology in St. Petersburg and transferred all the copyright for over 100 of the discoveries to that institution. Institute. They managed to procure financial support to enable them to continue paying the patent fees. This is how all their know-how got to stay in Russia. The scope of peptide research continued to grow. Marozov and Kavinson invited new researchers and contracted new facilities to work on their project, which benefited from fresh minds and state-of-the-art equipment. A lot of our research was dedicated to studying infections in primates. As monkeys are unique test subjects in that they can develop practically all the infectious conditions that occur in humans. In some cases, they are the only possible test subjects because only primates and humans are sensitive to certain bacteria and viruses. To create a model of these diseases is possible only with monkeys. With them, vaccines can be tested against these infectious agents. For example, the eradication of polio, poliomyelitis, as an epidemic disease is largely thanks to the fact that monkeys were used in the experiments. After 1997, a lot of publications appeared expanding on the unique properties of peptides extracted from the pineal gland. They claim that these peptides were capable of restoring the functions of every organ and endocrine gland, which would be a totally outstanding achievement. Thus, it made me on the one hand quite skeptical, but on the other, it tempted me to try and see for myself how these agents would work in primates, my research subjects. Rhesus monkeys, just like humans, have endogenous circadian rhythm cycles, and their pineal glands produce melatonin at night, just like that of humans. 
активность пениальных пептидов, таких как so we set a task for ourselves to check the efficiency of pineal peptides such as epitalon. Epitalon is a synthetic tetrapeptide that was obtained by the Institute of Bioregulation and Gerontology. It was reported to stimulate production of melatonin by the pineal gland in both young and old rats alike. But this didn't really make much sense to me because it seemed to be at odds with biological necessity. Why would both young and old test subjects develop similar levels of melatonin? We presume that the same test would have to yield different results in such highly organized animals as monkeys, who, unlike rats, have the same daily rhythm cycle as humans. In 2000, a four-month test was run on two sets of animal groups, young and old. The dose of 10 micrograms of epitalon was administered daily to subjects in the treatment groups and a placebo to animals in the control groups. 10 micrograms is a very small amount, which means it's highly tolerable. Usually, a single dose of a medicinal preparation is several milligrams or grams. At the end of the test, blood samples were taken to check melatonin levels. We compared melatonin levels in blood of all four animal groups and saw that the administered epitalon increased night melatonin levels in old subjects. At the same time, it brought about no change in melatonin levels in younger animals. It appeared that melatonin levels in old animals increased to match the levels that are normal in young monkeys. That prompted the conclusion that pineal cells of young monkeys which were functioning normally simply ignored the administered peptides as they were not needed. This meant that peptides do their work only when necessary. It was another breakthrough which gave impetus to further research. Our new task was to find out whether epitalon could ensure protection of the nervous, cardiovascular and hematopoietic systems against continuous exposure to stress and premature aging in humans. Application of epitalon triggers off a chain of recovery processes which restore the normal functioning of all body systems. It's essential to achieve recovery of the higher regulatory systems first, as they'll then be able to take care of everything else. It would be safe to say that we may expect new preparations to be produced in the near future, which would help older people deal with their cardiovascular conditions, improve their cerebral circulation and relieve other ailments caused by aging. The positive regulatory effect of the preparations was confirmed. The old animals enhanced their capacity to withstand continuous stress. Their immune system was boosted, their coat became healthy and shiny, and the animals looked better and developed more active behavior patterns. The computer age that started in the 1990s brought science and research to a dramatically new level. Computers could process large bulks of data in mere seconds. And since they had become universally available, development moved on in giant steps. 3D modeling was born. People not involved in scientific research are familiar with 3D movies. Long extinct dinosaurs came alive and practically jumped off the screen. And 3D representations of Hollywood stars set out on endless quests in computer games. In terms of scientific progress, however, the possibility to model any complex live or mechanical system became paramount in that it finally supplied the ultimate validity test for the ideas developed back in the 70s. All advanced industries and scientific research, including air and space exploration and chemistry and biology, switched to 3D design technologies. It saved a huge amount of money thanks to the fact that much testing was now run on mathematical models as opposed to real prototypes. Mathematical model is a description of a system, object or process using mathematical concepts and language. Mathematical models use mathematical notions to describe the main parameters of the modeled object, process or system.
So nano projects got their chance to be tested and developed further. Drexler and Freitas introduced the world to the technical wonders of nano robotics, and biology scientists from all over the world proceeded to work on the global protein data bank project. Designing a mathematical model of a molecule would replicate its actual spatial configuration and takes into account both the energy levels of all the comprising atoms and the molecule's motion trajectory in the medium was now the researcher's dream come true. The rate of knowledge exchange soared. Supercomputer centers used in the past to do calculations for nuclear and space projects were now used to explore the depths of the human body. It should be noted that it was researchers at the Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry who were the first ever to identify the structure of a live protein molecule. It happened in 1983, and up to now the Institute remains one of the world's leading research hubs. The research to identify a protein structure is conducted on one half a milliliter of the solution containing that protein. That tiny amount contains 10 to the power of 17 protein molecules. Furthermore, each molecule comprises some 20,000 atoms. Can you imagine it? And now, what we do is we look at a pair of adjacent atoms and measure the distance between them. We do this for all the atoms in the molecule, and after we're done measuring all these distances, alongside with lots of other parameters, we can produce a model of the molecule's structure, where we have pinpointed all the position measurements for all atoms. We can also capture movement patterns of all atoms in that molecule, and produce relevant amplitude and frequency measurements, thus building a physical model of the protein's function patterns. All the obtained data describing the processes that occur in a molecule are submitted for processing to the Mathematical Modeling Laboratory. We have researched the properties of large systems, including some supramolecular systems such as proteins of biological membranes. These are very complex systems which consist of hundreds of thousands of atoms. We developed tentative behavioral models for these systems and ran experiments which proved the accuracy of the mathematical models we came up with. The key thing is that the model's processing must be relevant. One shouldn't expect a mathematical model to give readings it wasn't designed for or fine-tuned to produce. Roughly speaking, everything we can do today with the help of nuclear magnetic resonance is like a modern movie compared to early daguerreotype prints. And watching this movie gives us a much better understanding of how it all works, helping in our efforts to develop a drug that will repair the wrong moves this or that protein makes, fixing their function. The time has come when we can finally implement all the developments of fundamental science, all those things that we earlier considered unachievable. Today we have the technologies to produce the drugs of the future. This is possible thanks to a massive research and extensive molecular design effort that we undertook to ensure that our agents have the required properties and produce the desired effect. Maximum lifespan based on the dates of birth and death of longest living persons that were verified to modern norms is currently defined at 110 to 120 years. However, average lifespan remains 70 to 75 years throughout different countries. And this is believed to be the effect of premature aging syndrome. Humans have a capacity for another 30 to 45 years. We do a lot of research in this area. We study how mechanisms of aging are developing and look for ways we can hold them back with the help of peptide bioregulators. Our experiments on test animals have shown that a peptide-enhanced diet administered to mature animals increased their actual lifespan by 30 to 38 percent. Более того, эти исследования были проведены на людях по продлению жизни. Это это было сделано в Киеве в Институте геронтологии. Moreover, this research on life extension was carried out on humans. 
This was done in Kiev and St. Petersburg for 12 years. The use of peptides reduced mortality by a factor of two. Today, we can say unequivocally that it is Russia that is doing the most to reduce mortality rates with its bioregulation technologies. This is unique. Similar preparations exist nowhere else in the world. However, when published in foreign scientific journals, reports of the outstanding achievements made by Russian researchers raised doubts in expert circles, especially since the new data plainly refuted the globally recognized norms and limits. The global research community proceeded to run their checks. We prepared some purified pineal gland peptides as well as some synthetic peptides and samples of frozen tissue of the mice that we had run longevity experiments on and sent them off to the USA. There, the US National Institute of Aging processed over 15,000 genes and confirmed the gene-specific effect of peptides. It was unique research. We've found out how it works. Now we'd like to figure out why it works this way. Every organ has a 30% reserve of polypotent or stem cells. That's nature's design, it's just how it is. And when this reserve gets to be employed sparingly, but consistently over a lifetime and to its full scope, the result is a long lifespan of 100 to 110 years. And thus every person has 30 years of this reserve. And so it appears that what the pioneer of nanomedicine, Eric Drexler, called the preparation of the future has already been developed, tested and used in medical practice in Russia. Let's recall what Drexler says about today's conventional drugs. Though drug molecules affect the tissues on a molecular level, all these drugs are too primitive to feel, plan and work independently. However, medical preparations of tissue-specific peptides affect directly targeted tissue cells. At the moment, over 25 tissue-specific preparations have been developed and they work with atomic precision. Completely free of adverse effects, they enhance the genetic abilities of the patient's organism rather than just fill in for the functions of damaged tissues. They help the body activate its own reserves supplied by nature. And that's exactly what a smart drug should do, i.e. to feel and work. As for planning, I think we could safely leave it to people, doctors and patients. That's a big responsibility. And so I think it should be theirs. It's human health that is at stake after all. The 2007 European Congress on Gerontology was held in St. Petersburg as a tribute to the outstanding achievements of Russian scientists from the Institute of Gerontology and Bioregulation in finding a solution to healthy longevity. However, despite the fact that success is obviously there and has received wide international recognition, all these discoveries have not made it to the mass market either in Russia or elsewhere. Why is that? Who would vote against a long and healthy life? One thing we know is that there has recently been a sudden surge of interest in genetic research in American business circles. This is intriguing, since the US is very strict and clear on protecting their citizens' sensitive genetic data. Why are businesses trying to access this kind of classified information? My group was once invited to do joint research with an American university. And do you know what they requested us to do for them? They wanted us to help run tests on the genetic material of the siege of Leningrad survivors. Although they have everything in the United States, they just never had experienced anything like that siege. They had never had such a population group, and so they had no material to run tests on. That is why they wanted us to fill in this gap for them. And you know who the customer was? It was a group of insurance companies. They want to be able to assess the applicant health and longevity capacity as precisely as possible. If the insured has an exceptionally healthy genome and is likely to live to the age of 100, they will bear losses. There are also mortgage problems in the USA, which ensure that in the case of the mortgage holder's death, their property is forfeited to insurance companies. So it's not good business if mortgage holders live up to 100 years old. The Leningrad siege was considered to be a model factor for natural selection. 
We can understand why business regards people as merely numbers in various financial operations. And when the profits of a large insurance empire at stake, they'll get the clearance they need for classified genetic information regardless of the law. Prospective clients' genome will be compared against the genetic data of the Leningrad seed survivors to ensure a profit-making decision. However, medical discoveries that can significantly prolong people's lives and prevent companies from taking over their property are bound never to see the light of day. The new biomolecular medicine has now hit a wall put up by pharmaceutical corporations which have monopolized the global market. Our scientists have made a sad discovery. Russia no longer manufactures drugs and only packages imported products. The reason behind this is a profound setback in Russia's domestic pharmaceutical industry's development and lack of funds. Even when truly new and competitive products or technology appear in the country, instead of being welcomed they are hindered and obstructed. The curse of our country, although we may not be alone in this, is that officials appear not to be interested in developing the domestic pharmaceutical industry. They obviously find doing business with international pharmaceutical corporations much more attractive and are ready to spend money on licenses. And we all know that the problem of deal kickbacks is a very serious one here. In 2004, Morozov and Kavinson turned to Andrei Sorokin, a successful businessman, inviting him to participate in a project that would promote their discoveries to the market. Sorokin's enterprise, the Academy of Scientific Beauty, together with the researchers, started by pinpointing four primary business areas – dental care, vision care, sports and beauty care. We have registered our new project, Vivox, which means longevity, because all our products are designed to improve wellness and promote longevity. Their hands were tied because they couldn't market these products as medications. It was the only way to avoid massive resistance from the multinational pharmaceutical companies and domestic officials regulating drug circulation. Our products are somewhere in between medical and beauty care products. On the one hand, their active components develop through scientific research or of a medicinal nature and have a pronounced medicinal effect on the organism. Yet, on the other hand, the products have been developed for use in beauty care products, which makes them very customer friendly. Our toothpaste, creams and gels are not perceived as drugs, but work just as well. Peptides from relevant tissues have been used to produce massage creams for athletes, gels and toothpaste for dental care, eye drops for vision care, and facials for users of beauty products. Sometimes even doctors themselves, who are experts and know a lot about chemical compositions and their effects, fail to be convinced of our product's efficacy. And this is normal. Doctors must question and test medications. Preparations based on peptides extracted from bone and cartilage tissues have been tested by Dr. Marina Kalesnichenka in her dental clinic. We've been quite surprised with the results. As a doctor working with my patients on a daily basis, I have every opportunity to see the performance of a drug or treatment in progress. And you know, I never expected these preparations to improve the patient's conditions so dramatically. Dr. Kalesnichenka applied peptide preparations in the most hopeless cases when traditional methods couldn't save the tooth. This patient came to me when most of her teeth had been removed, and they were removed for the same reason that we see here. This is an x-ray taken at the beginning of the treatment, showing extensive granuloma. Although the patient was resigned to having the tooth removed, she was unwilling, so we tried to save the tooth, and it worked. Here's an x-ray of the first phase of treatment after canal filling. And here's an x-ray at the end, where you can see that the bone has fully recovered and is exactly the same in structure as that of the adjacent healthy teeth. Bone tissue recovery rate has proved to be fantastic. 
Concerning x-rays, there's a prevalent opinion that we may not see any positive results in an x-ray for as long as up to six months after the initial treatment. In other words, bone tissue takes up to six months to recover and grow. But in our test cases, x-rays showed significant bone tissue growth just 30 to 45 days after treatment. So we're talking about accelerated bone tissue growth here, a much more efficient kind of growth than usual. In some cases, the tissue grew even though we didn't expect it to at all. I'm talking about cases of vertical bone reduction. When the bone had been reduced vertically, we observed some vertical growth of the bone tissue, which is quite outstanding given that even plastic bone surgery does not always guarantee such a result. This is because it involves not only the treatment agent, but also the so-called guides, the special membranes that help the bone grow vertically. One should also remember that any kind of surgery, even laser, involves tissue injuries and are very painful and quite complex, and all this for an insignificant result. From my point of view, peptide preparations give an organism the ability to function properly. After sports doctors introduced peptide preparations into their treatment programs, athletes quickly developed an appreciation of them, especially those who do sports with a high risk of injury. Kite surfing is a relatively new sport which is getting very popular despite its high risk of injuries. When I train, I always have three creams with me that I cannot do without. In addition, I have a portable iontophoresis machine and when used with the creams it works miracles for me. Athletes and sports enthusiasts know all too well that even a short break in everyday training is sure to cause intense muscle pain, which can last for days. This muscle pain is just killing you. You can't get up out of bed because your body is aching all over. Vivax helped me reduce this painful period from five to two to three days. It was a huge and pleasant surprise to me. It's great that these painful periods are down to two days now, and then I'm in great shape again. One of the athletic therapists even tried explaining to Yevgeny that a gel simply cannot produce such an effect from a scientific point of view. A human body is created in such a way that everything in it is taken care of and that no potentially harmful substance can penetrate through the skin barrier beyond a certain point. But nonetheless, even though I don't understand myself how it works, I am the living proof that it does. For example, I got badly bruised last night and the bruise was gone by the morning. You can think whatever you want, but if it helps you once, then it helps you twice. And you just start believing in it. It just works and that's it. В России как-то да, да вообще в мире не так много кремов Neither Russia nor any other sports country can boast gels that can heal and effectively prevent sports injuries. I happened to hurt my foot once and tried Vivax, and I felt an improvement in just two to three days. The swelling went down and I started to feel better. I started to get mobility back. Then I found out that there are two more creams available, one with a cooling and the other with a warming effect. And they are good to use before and after a workout or a training session. Basketball players spend half their lives on the basketball court. The teams train every day for eight to nine months every season. And that means that their muscles are warming up and cooling down every day. These creams can help keep the muscles warm during the training sessions and speed up recovery after training. Now, whenever I get injured, I apply the regenerating Vivex cream and thanks to it I recover much faster. For instance, usually a sprained ankle would take about three to four weeks to heal. But now it heals twice as fast and you can use additional therapies together with Vivex. You can get back to normal in just one week. Глаз настолько сложное образование орган, что в нем представлены все виды тканей, которые есть в человеческом организме.
The human eye is a very sophisticated organ, which contains a little bit of every kind of tissue there is in the human body. There is nervous tissue, connective tissue, and what's more, there are all types of connective tissue found in the eye. There are also some unique tissues in the eye that cannot be found anywhere else in the human body. For instance, the crystalline lens. An eye care specialist must understand what tissue they are dealing with in every single case. Let's consider, for example, the retina. The retina is a light sensitive tissue lining the inner surface of the eye and each of its cells has a connection with the back part of the brain. Which is responsible for interpreting the signals that are created when light strikes the retina. Thus, every single one of the retina's cells is valuable. However, there are also group formations of cells which ensure sustained vision function even when some individual retina cells get damaged. If that happens, other cells in the group take over the functions of the damaged cell. However, if the damage is massive, we get an unfortunate result a loss of vision. Thus, there is a high demand for medical agents which can sustain all the tissue cells in the eye. At present, we have some preparations of this kind that have been developed through advanced biological technologies, among them retinolamine. Retinolamine is a peptide bioregulator developed jointly by the Institute of Gerontology and Bioregulation and the St. Petersburg. This is one of the priority research areas at the Institute of Gerontology and Bioregulation. I think that current achievements are already giving us a chance to make a difference. This is an intense research area today. France has opened a special institute to study peptides. America is investing huge amounts of money in this research too. So what is the key challenge here? It is the promotion of our discoveries, introducing them into mass production and mass consumption. Aging of the population, including increasing rates of premature aging, are an unsolved problem in all developed countries. This appears to be reason enough to think that new Russian peptide preparations are sure to make it to the global market. What other reason does one need really? Today, it is one of Russia's most promising high-tech development projects. Whenever God sends a disease into our world, he always supplies a remedy. We only need to discover it.